send me the link, it then occurred to me what I'm going to do instead. I'm going to let you today, I'm going to finish today what I was going to do last week. We'll start new material. Uh, and then I will record on Blackboard or Zoom, I'm not sure which, I'll let you know. I will record because they have a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, uh, part of the lecture that I will ask you to look at and take up about as much time as we missed last week. And so uh, rather than do that this previous week, we're going to have a whole class today, but you will also be required, might be required to come to class, to spend uh, an hour or so looking at the Zoom link that I'll send you sometime in the next few days. Um, well, I'm not sure exactly when I'll send it, but it's going to be on international trade, and I'll send it when I'm at the appropriate point on the international trade lecture. Maybe after this lecture, it's possible to be after next week's. But there will be a Zoom recorded thing for you to look at, or a Blackboard thing for you to look at, that I will, that, that makes up for the time that we lost last week because of the fire alarm. Yes, ma'am. Is it next class? Yeah. Well, then it's not next class. <laughs> I'm, I'm delaying it. Uh, so, so it will be the, it'll probably be the one after that. I, I, I must, that must have been a type of or a carelessness on my part putting that week through. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. I wasn't being sarcastic out there. Okay. You guys ready? So I'm going to finish the discussion we were having last week about the minimum wage, which was interrupted by the um, fire alarm. I recognize it is a controversial topic. You draw from it whatever lessons, whatever normative lessons you wish. I have a few more things to say about it. And when we conclude that, we will conclude our discussion of price controls. And then we'll move to a radically different or seemingly radically different topic. But I have several more minutes of things to share with you about, about the minimum wage. So, you recall from last week, the minimum wage is a price floor. It's one of the few price floors that we have in reality. We have many more price ceilings, price floors set above the equilibrium. In this case, the price is called wage. It's the name we give for the hourly price of labor. And as predicted by economics, when, the, when you raise the minimum wage, we assume it's above the equilibrium. Otherwise, it would make no point. It would make, make, make no sense for government to bother legislating minimum wage. The wage set above the equilibrium, remember these are low skilled workers. The higher, at that high minimum wage, the quantity supply of labor increases and becomes more attractive for people to work if they can get a higher wage. And at the same time, the quantity demanded of labor falls. Not every job has to be done, and it becomes, at the higher wage, it becomes more and more uh, attractive for employers to substitute machines for human labor. Get an ATM machine rather than hire someone to be a, to be a teller. Uh, Invest in larger lawn mowers so that you need fewer, you need to hire fewer people to uh, uh, work for you in your lawn care service. There are many, many countless different ways to substitute non human means of production for human means of production. And the higher the wage, the more attractive it is for employers to do that. And so the standard economic prediction, you recall from last week, these first few minutes are just a review of last week, real quickly. The standard economic prediction is that the minimum wage causes unemployment of low-skilled workers. Remember, only a small handful of workers in America are affected by the minimum wage, less than 5%. But it's still, in absolute numbers, fairly large numbers, millions of workers. These are mostly teenagers. They're all unskilled workers. No, no worker with any skill gets paid the minimum wage because they are, they, 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 they are too valuable to employers, and so employers pay them more. A worker who can produce, say, $20 an hour, but who's, pay, who's being paid less than that, that's like what, the, at least for economists, is the proverbial $20 bill lying on the sidewalk. 
Think about it. You very seldom see cash laying on the sidewalk. Every now and then. I think in my life I can recall once finding cash with a five dollar bill laying on the ground. Pick it up. I was very happy. It's cheap money. Well, we don't see that often. And the reason you don't see it often is because it's very easy to bend down to pick up the cash. It's pure profit. A worker who is underpaid, say a worker who can produce $20 an hour, who's being paid less than that, that's pure profit to another employer. Hey, come work with, come work for me. I'll pay you more. Rather than continue, continuing to work at your current job where you're being underpaid. And so competitive forces in markets push wages up to reflect worker productivity. The minimum wage, however, raises the wage of low-skilled workers above the level of their productivity, causing many of them to be unemployed. So we saw last week there's a trade-off. Some workers do continue to be employed at the minimum wage. This amount, QD workers, they get paid the higher wage. That's a good. Some workers, however, lose jobs. The difference, this is the number of workers who are employed with the minimum wage. This is the number of workers who would be employed without the minimum wage QD. So the Right. This number of workers lose their jobs or don't get jobs because of the minimum wage. Their income goes to zero. It falls. And they're unable to get employment. As I said last week, one of the important, particularly for workers of this sort, young workers, one of the particularly important aspects of employment is not just the income they get. It's the job experience, because that enables them to get on-the-job skills, on-the-job experience, job references, to move to labor markets in which the workers have higher skills and hence escape being paid the minimum wage. Once again, a typical minimum wage worker in the United States works for less than a year at that wage. They move into higher skilled labor markets. So that's the trade-off. I think that's kind of where we were last week. But we can say more about that. The trade-off's not random. Oh, actually, before I get to the trade-off, let me just note one thing. I think I noted this last week, but I want to be sure I did. This looks like all gain to the workers who keep their jobs at the minimum wage. But it's not necessarily so. It could be. But when the work, when the employer now has to pay a higher wage, the employer, particularly now that there's a surplus of workers, there's a lot of people willing to take those jobs. And you only have a relatively few jobs to offer uh, employment for. Employers now have an incentive and an ability to increase the difficulty of the job, to make the workers work harder, to make the job less pleasant, to be more strict in uh, compelling workers to show up on time, more strict in not allowing workers to leave early, uh, allowing workers fewer uh, um, uh, less time on the job to do personal texting and telephoning. So the job becomes less attractive. So it's not all gain. But again, these workers unquestionably are made worse off. They get a little bit of leisure, but they don't want that leisure. They prefer to be employed. But they can't find jobs, and so they get zero employment. It would be one thing, it would be bad enough, if it were random, if it was like a coin flip. Well, you get the job, you keep the job at the minimum wage, you don't keep the job at the minimum wage. But it's probably not random. In fact, we're almost certain it's not random. Here's a trivia question for you. In 1948, and in a moment I'll explain the significance of the year 1948. In 1948, which group had the highest level of unemployment? White teenagers, ages 16 to 17, or black teenagers? ages 16 to 17. Which group had the highest unemployment? White teenagers. White teenagers had an unemployment rate in 1948 of 10.4%. Black teenagers had an unemployment rate of 9.8%. You don't have to know those numbers. The numbers aren't important. It's just important to know that in 1948, the unemployment rate among black teenagers was lower than among white teenagers. What's happened over the years, and this is yet another reason why I despise this classroom, because again, draw it easily on the board. What's happened to the, here's the unemployment rate of white teenagers over the years from 1948 until today. Pretty 
much flat. Maybe a little bit upward. Pretty much flat. Here's the unemployment rate of black teenagers over those years. It's gone way up. Often it's about three times the unemployment rate of white teenagers. So what explains that? The standard explanation is racism. But that doesn't make much sense because surely, as bad as racism is today, it was almost certainly worse in 1948. And the unemployment rate of blacks, young blacks in 1948 was lower than that of whites. No one would argue that, well, in 1948, there was racism against whites in favor of blacks. No one would argue that because it would be absurd. So what explains that trend? Why did the unemployment rate of white teenagers stay pretty much the same? Unemployment rate of black teenagers go up. Economists explain it with the minimum wage. Yep. Yeah. Probably it's because the amount of people found was definitely decreasing with the black teenagers. Well, so we have to explain why is it that the that the minimum wage, if the economists are right, the economists basically, the economists generally say this trend, this unfortunate, regrettable trend, was caused by the minimum wage. Why would black teenagers be more affected, disproportionately poorly affected by the minimum wage than white teenagers? There are two reasons. One is racism. If people have, if employers have prejudice, then the minimum wage ironically shields employers from practicing their prejudice. You can't, if you're an employee, you can't offer to work at a wage lower than the minimum. And so if you're a black teenager and you want a job, and you're trying to get a job with someone who is bigoted against blacks, you can't say, I'll work for you for a nickel less, dime less, 50 cents less. So it's, it's illegal. Without the minimum wage, you could do that. And that was done. With the minimum wage in place, put looked at somewhat differently, because it creates a surplus of workers, now it gives employers a bigger pool of workers who they can choose among. So to the extent that employers might be racist, now they have a better pool of workers. I got 10 people who want a job, I have only two job openings, I get to be pretty picky. I don't like blacks, I don't like women, I don't like gay people, I don't like short people, I don't like whoever people, so I'm gonna not choose those people, I'm gonna choose the people I like. Probably, though, the more complete explanation doesn't have much to do with racism. It just has to do with the competitiveness of, of the markets. Because the, uh, this is what I was saying at the end of last week's class, now remember, because the firms that employ low-skilled workers all tend to be in highly competitive industries. Food, restaurants, food retailing, retailing generally, lawn care services, leisure and hospitality. Minimum wage workers don't work in manufacturing plants. They must say work as janitors. Because the, these industries are highly competitive, firms in those industries don't have a lot of leeway. They have to be sure that they keep their, they have to work as hard as they can to keep their costs as low as possible. They got to get. They got to be sure they hire workers that they get the most out of that they possibly can. And so, even an employer who's not in any way bigoted against anyone, the employer has several workers to choose among. That employer is likely to choose among all the job applicants the the job applicant who has his or her own car, who went to a better school system, who has a lot more advantages. That tends to be whites compared to blacks. And so whites get hired more. Thus, over the years, since 1948, the unemployment rate of black teenagers has gone up. The unemployment rate of white teenagers pretty much stayed the same, despite the fact that in 1948, the unemployment rate of black teenagers was lower. And by the way, it was lower for many years prior to that as well. 
So even without any evil motives, you still get this bad effect. It's not anyone's intention, but that is, as economics teaches us, simply one of the many cases in which we get unintended consequences from, from um, uh, uh, policies that are generally well-meaning. I'll actually explain in a moment that the origins of the minimum wage were not so pretty, but I'll say that in, in just a moment. So the minimum wage creates this trade-off. Some workers get higher wages, some workers are unemployed. Secondly, that trade-off is not random. It negatively affects groups that can least afford it. My son's 25 now. Well, when he was a teenager, he grew up in Fairfax County, went to private schools. When he was a teenager, he never had, he never had trouble finding a job. He always got a job at the minimum wage. He had more spending money. His mother worked, I worked. He didn't need the money. He could spend more money at GameStop, which he did. But he, but he had a job. Thank you, minimum wage. My son got paid a higher wage because of the minimum wage. Of that, I have no doubt. But someone out there, I don't know who, Someone out there was unemployed as a result of my son getting a higher wage that he didn't need. And as I said, not only do those workers who don't get jobs today or who lose their jobs today lose current income, as I've said many times now, they lose on-the-job experience. So what that does over time is it pushes this supply curve of unskilled workers out. If all 16-year-olds who wanted a job today got a job, they would not be unskilled workers when they're 17. But because of the minimum wage, some of, them, some of those 16-year-olds continue to be unemployed. When they're 17, they never had a job. And so they continue at 17 to be unemployed. And they get added to the new 16-year-olds who enter the job market. So what happens over time is that the minimum wage pushes out the supply curve, and we get this effect. Supply curve shifts out. And so the amount of unemployment increases as a result of the minimum wage, making matters only worse. We didn't have a minimum wage in the United States until 1948, excuse me, 1938. The legislation that created the minimum wage in 1938 is still the statute that is on the books, and it is still the statute under which the current federal minimum wage is promulgated. It's called the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. It did other things, but the minimum wage was a big thing that it did. The first minimum wage in the U.S. was 25 cents an hour. That was 1938. 25 cents an hour was a lot more money than it is today. 1938, that was about $4. It must be boring people. Everybody's leaving. Did I bore you, sir? I thought I'd ask. Some of you don't laugh. Some of you back there will leave, too, I know. So, And you can tell me if you're, if, if, before you leave if I'm boring you. You can even say, you're boring me. I'm leaving. Anyway, um, so the first minimum wage was 25 cents an hour, just less than $5 an hour today. It's not great, more than 25 cents an hour, however. Anyway, so the first minimum wage was 25 cents an hour, 1938. So why did we get the first minimum wage? You might think, it was because low-skilled workers went to Congress and said, you know, we're low-skilled workers. We want to get higher wages. And Congress, being attentive to its constituents' best wishes, said, yes, we will raise your wage. At least the intentions were good. But that's not what we see if we look at the congressional record. You know who lobbied for the minimum wage in 1938? Owners of textile mills in New England. Textile mill owners lobbied for the minimum wage in 1938. They're the ones who really wanted a minimum wage. Also, so those textile mills were unionized. The labor unions also lobbied 
the labor unions for those textile mills in New England lobbied for the minimum wage. Those workers in those textile mills were getting paid in New England about 25 cents an hour. Why would workers in New England and their employers of the, in the textile mills, why would they go to Congress and demand that Congress enact the minimum wage that basically would raise the wages of all workers in America up to about the level that the textile mills in New England, mostly Massachusetts, were paying? Yeah. Say again. Here's the story. You 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 can you can just close. Yeah. If a if a, if a company if, if if it's profitable for a company to raise wages, it can do it on its own. They have to be told by government to do it. I'm not sure if that's what you're saying. Here, here's here's this, here's what happened. I mean, by the way, this is not controversial at all. I mean, everyone who studied the history of the minimum wage agrees with this. This is not a uh, a, 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 an account that is disputed. Um, starting in the early part of the 20th century, the South, the American South, began finally to enter the modern world. And as you all know, for most of the 19th century, the South was, a, was an antiquarian, decrepit slave economy, plantation economy, had a handful of really rich people, and everybody else was poor, not least the slaves, of course. Civil War happens, a lot of destruction in the South. As is true everywhere, whenever a region starts to economically develop, the textile industry is usually the way, almost always, by the way, it's the first industry that develops. Happened, it happened in early America. That was, that was the first industry in New England, the textile industry, back in the early 19th century. In the early 20th century, finally, the, the American South begins to develop textile mills emerge in the, in the Carolinas and North Georgia. And so they had this pool of very, very poor, low-skilled workers. They have access to a lot of workers, so they're able to set up their operations in a way that didn't use a whole lot of machinery, but used a lot of workers. Because they had a lot of workers at their disposal. Workers who most of a lot of them, sharecropping was the next best option. Sharecropping is not a good way to make a living. I think the best way to make a living is that's your only option. It's not a good option. <clears throat> so the textile mills come along, and it's a much better option. People are clamoring for jobs in the textile mills in the Carolinas and Georgia. The average wage on the floor of the textile mills in 1938 in the South was 15 cents an hour. The owners of the textile mills in Massachusetts understood that they were losing, and they were, they were losing a lot of market share to textile mills in the American South. Every year they'd see their share of the market dwindle. They were selling less and less, fewer and fewer textiles. And they knew. Why? Because the textile mills in the South were selling more and more. Output's going up. Textile mills in South Carolina, Georgia, and North Carolina, selling more. Eastern Tennessee, selling more. They didn't like it. How do you stop it? You go to Congress, you can't say, outlaw the Southern mills. It simply can't be done. Constitution wouldn't admit it, no court would allow it. Let's have a more clever way. Well, what are the advantages that the Southern textile mills have over the Northern textile mills? Ah, they pay lower wages because of the way they operate, and they operate like that because they have access to a lot of most skilled workers. They pay only 15 cents an hour, we pay 25 cents an hour. Well, let's mandate that some textile mills pay 25 cents an hour too. The goal, in other words, of the minimum wage wasn't to help most skilled workers. It was to help Northeastern textile mills defeat the competition from Southern textile mills. It was meant to put Southern textile mills out of business in order to create monopoly power for textile mills in mostly Massachusetts, Northeast, some of Pennsylvania. It had nothing to do with helping low skilled workers. In fact, the low skilled workers who would lose jobs and go back to sharecropping in the South 
That was no one. They didn't care. They just wanted to protect the market for these northern textile mills. That was the original intent of the minimum wage. Now, since then, I think most people who support the minimum wage do so not out of that sort of evil intent, but rather out of the genuine, sincere belief that it will help all workers. As we see, economics did the reason to believe that that's not true. But if you can believe something sincerely, you know it's not, not true, and, and be well-meaning about it. Fortunately, fortunately, the uh, uh, there have been very few silver linings around world wars, but here's one. Uh, it, by, so the Fair Labor Standards Act is enacted in 1938, doesn't really go into effect until 1939. 1939 is the year the war breaks out in Europe. Although the United States didn't enter the war until 1941, the United States increasingly kept supplying war material to the Allies, and, and the U.S. government increasingly knew that at one point the U.S. government was probably going to get involved in World War II, so it started stockpiling material. And so the, right around the time the Fair Labor Standards Act kicks in, the U.S. government starts buying up a lot of textiles in order to make uniforms for soldiers, both Allied soldiers and later American soldiers. So that was enough to keep both the southern textile mills and the northern textile mills in business. But which is why economists don't really start studying the consequences, the economic consequences of the minimum wage until 1948, after the war ended, after the, after the, the economy is demilitarized. And in 1948, we get the first post-war increase in the minimum wage. And then we can see what happened. And so when we start looking at the minimum wage in that year, when uh, 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 it, it, it first really starts to take effect in a peacetime economy, we see that, again, the unemployment rate of the workers who are most affected by it, unskilled teenagers, is lower among blacks than it is among whites. After that time, the unemployment rate of blacks rose significantly, the unemployment rate of white teenagers stayed pretty much constant. So that today, the unemployment rate of black teenagers is a lot higher than that of white teenagers, plausibly explained by, by the minimum wage. Um, one other bit of history, two other things to say about the minimum wage. One thing is a piece of history. So we can look at, so what Congress does, Congress has to legislate to raise the minimum wage. So every increase in the minimum wage has been done by legislative decree. Congress says we will raise the minimum wage to X number of dollars in, in, in a certain year. Um, one of the most uh, uh, one of the largest single in percentage increases in the minimum wage occurred, I think, in 1961. Maybe 1960. I always confuse the years. 60 or 61. I was only two. I don't remember very well. Um, it must have been 61 because Kennedy was president. And uh, uh, we know from looking at the legislative history that the Otis Elevator Company was a major supporter of raising the minimum wage. That's curious. Why would the Otis Elevator Company care about the minimum wage? The Otis Elevator Company employed no minimum wage workers. Building elevators, that's pretty high-skilled occupation. Well, all the workers in the Otis Elevator factory were highly paid, skilled workers. Blue collar, but highly paid, skilled ones. The Otis Elevator really wanted the minimum wage to increase. Why? Turns out, here's good speculation. This is the best. This is the best that economists can figure out. Uh, the Otis Elevator Company owned the best patent, not the only one, but the best patent on automatic elevator technology. All the elevators we ride in today are automatic elevators. They're basically passenger driven. You get into the uh, an elevator is just just public transportation that goes vertically. So you get into an elevator and you want to go from the first floor to the tenth floor. You get in, you press 10, and you drive yourself to the 10th floor, and it opens up and stops, and you get up. You're like getting into the metro car, at the met a metro train, and you press, you know, Tenley Town Station, and it goes there and lets you out. In the late 1950s, there was a huge effort 
Um, there was still a lot of elevators in the United States that were manually operated. As a young boy, I remember getting into some of these, and there would be a, 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 a usually an old person. They were retirees. They would sit on a on a bench in the corner of the elevator, and they're, they're like basically just like a metro car driver. You get to the metro car, and it's driven by a driver. They had elevator drivers. They were called elevator operators. And these are, it's not a very high skilled job. You just basically you, you ask, "What floor are you going to?" Four. You drive it to the fourth floor. Then you open the door, and the person gets out on the fourth floor. Not a very high skilled job, but it's a job that a lot of retirees had. The oldest elevator company got frustrated. It had this brilliant patent for automatic elevators. And we go around the country saying, hey, why don't you buy one of our automatic elevators? And the building manager said, nah, we have a, we have a, we, we have a manually operated elevator, which is fine. Yeah, but you gotta hire those workers. Nah. They're not very expensive. So thank you, but no thank you. We will not be buying one of your Ogus elevators. But what if you make the wage that you have to pay elevator operators a lot higher? Part of the story, there was, a, there was a, a U.S. Supreme Court decision, I think in 1956 it was, that increased the, 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 the reach of the minimum wage. Some workers who before that were not considered to fall under federal jurisdiction came to, be, came to fall under federal jurisdiction. Now, elevator operators came to fall under federal jurisdiction. So the El Otis Elevator Company understands, quite rightly, wow, we get the minimum wage increase. All these building managers have to pay their elevator operators more. Don't just think of a building with one elevator. Think of buildings in Manhattan, in Los Angeles, in Chicago, with banks of dozens of elevators operating 24-7, 365. Got to hire a lot of workers to man those things. To suddenly have to raise the wage of them all, now it becomes more expensive to keep your, your manually operated elevator in operation meaning it becomes relatively more attractive to rip that thing out and put in an automatic elevator. Sure enough, the minimum wage rises, and in the early 1960s, we have this wave of, 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 of installations of automatic elevators. Automatic elevators probably would have, they surely would have come along anyway. But the minimum wage sped that up. I think that was a bad thing. It sped it up by denying these people employment. These people lost their jobs. What do you think is a good thing or a bad thing? It's at least the case that the political pressure for the 1961 increase in the minimum wage came in large part from a company that stood to gain materially from it, the Otis Elevator Company. It wasn't a pure public interest thing. We want to help most skilled workers. Let's raise the minimum wage. Until 19, until the mid-1990s, there was a huge, strong consensus among economists about everything I've just said about the minimum wage. The minimum wage causes some unemployment uh, it, uh, and uh, 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 has all these negative effects. Most economists, no matter where they sat in the political spectrum, opposed the minimum wage, not because they love employers. As I pointed out last week, the discussion here is not employers versus workers. It's workers versus workers. Those workers who keep their jobs and those workers who lose their jobs. All the negative effects that I've pointed out about the minimum wage are negative effects on workers. I don't care about negative effects on employers. Employers can, give, can, can handle it. One of the most famed studies of the minimum wage was a four-year study commissioned by Jimmy Car President Jimmy Carter in 1977. He set up something called the Minimum Wage Commission. He was convinced that a really comprehensive study, even though lots of studies had been done before, a really comprehensive study would show that the minimum wage is a good thing for the economy. Jimmy Carter was a good man. He was not a very good economist. So alive, I shouldn't speak of the past tense. Um, so he sets up this commission in 1981. It delivers its verdict, and it's pretty resounding. You don't have to know these numbers, but the Minimum Wage Commission, this was uh, all the best economists from all the best institutions, 
all across the ideological spectrum, again, chosen by the Carter administration and the Democratic Congress, they concluded that roughly, on average, a 10%, for every 10% increase in the minimum wage, you get a 1% increase in unemployment among low-skilled workers. It's pretty significant. So you raise the minimum wage by 30%, you're going to get a 3% increase in unemployment among low-skilled workers. That's not insignificant. That pretty much was the consensus. It confirmed what economists knew before. That remained the consensus until the mid-1990s. In the mid-1990s, something called the New Economics emerged. There was a famous study done in the American Economic Review, which is the most prestigious journal in my profession, by, uh, you don't have to know these names, by David Card and Alan Kruger. David Card later went on to win the Nobel Prize in economics. And Card and Kruger claimed to have found that raising the minimum wage at least a little bit doesn't have these negative effects. This has caused a huge amount of controversy in the economics profession. It's been studied enormously since the debate still rages. About 77-0% of economic studies of the minimum wage, and these are churned out regularly, about 70% continue to find these negative effects. About 30% find the opposite. The majority of economists still believe that the minimum wage does have these negative effects on employment. But the consensus is not as strong as it once was because of this, of this work that was done in the mid-1990s. By the way, you can agree, you can believe, you can accept the economics that the minimum wage has these negative effects. That's a positive Conclusion, and still, and still um, support the minimum wage. That's a normative position. And you, you can say, oh, yeah, I agree it causes unemployment, but in my view, the gains to the workers who, who keep their jobs and, and get paid high wages, that's, that justifies, that more than makes up for the losses to the workers who lose their jobs. That's a perfectly fair position to take. But what the basic economics says, at least the vast majority of the basic economics says, now about 70% of the economics says, um, at least recognize the trade-off. Raising the minimum wage does not give a raise to all workers. It gives the raise to some workers, but it puts other workers out of jobs and denies them the opportunities to get skilled. Anyway, that's all I will say about the, oh, one other, one, just one other thing. Uh, one, one, one final thing. The intellectual push for minimum wages started long before 1938 when the United States got its first national minimum wage. The intellectual push for minimum wages started in Britain in the 1890s and came to America just a few years afterward. Uh, and it was started by eugenicists. Eugenics, you, you probably know eugenics, this is a now discredited uh, uh, scientific credence of about 100 or 100 so years ago. The eugenicists thought that, well, you know, that, that you can tell a different eugenic gene is the core word there. What we want to do is cleanse the gene pool. We want to we want to prevent people with poor genes from procreating so that we allow people with good genes to procreate. We'll, we'll create a better humanity. Pretty sick way of looking at the world, in my view. But it was all scientific rage back in in the in the so-called progressive era, the 1890s to the early part of the 20th century. And uh, uh, these eugenicists, although in, in my view they were pretty ethically questionable, they at least had their economics correct. They understood. They said, "Well, we, we, you know, a minimum wage would be a good thing." Because the minimum wage is going to cause some unemployment. And who's going to lose jobs? Well, the least productive workers will lose jobs. The least attractive workers will lose jobs. They will be unemployed. That will be a good way for us to identify who we should sterilize. That was an argument made. That was a major argument made 
by the earliest intellectual proponents of the minimum of the minimum wage in England and in the United States. So the minimum wage itself does not have a pretty history. Although again, I think the vast majority of people who support the minimum wage today do so out of out of good motives, but at least recognize, or you should at least recognize, that there is this potential trade-off between higher wages and unemployment. Any questions about the minimum wage? Yeah. Why was 1948 such an important year? Why is 1948 such an important year? So the minimum wage was passed in 1938. Then we immediately go basically to the wartime economy. And so for the next 40, 10 years, we're in a wartime economy. And you can't make any judgments about the economy before you know, the wartime economy. And so the, basically, the, the, the US, you know, I'm going to use the US economy demilitarizes in late 1946, mid to late 1946. And then in 1948, that's the first year after that that we get an increase in the minimum wage. That's when we can start studying it. Okay. So I'm going to switch gears pretty dramatically. I'm going to talk about international trade. So for those of you who came in late, just real quickly, uh, if you paid attention to the email I sent out last week after the fire alarm, um, what I'm going to do is uh, um, record, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a lecture on trade, but I also have a PowerPoint presentation that I want to share with you. And rather than do that in class, I'll make up the time we lost last week by sending you a, a lecture that I do with this PowerPoint presentation, and you will be required to look at that at your leisure whenever. So I'll send that to you uh, uh, soon. And it will be. Uh, on international trade. So why talk about international trade? A couple of reasons, uh, several reasons. One is, it's always in the news, if you pay attention to the news. Trade is always an issue, so it's relevant. A second reason is that by studying international trade, we actually can learn a lot more just about the basic economic way of thinking. It's a really good application of economics, as I, I hope you'll see when we, as we go through. A third reason is that economics began as a study of international trade. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, although it talked about many topics other than international trade, its chief topic, the main purpose behind uh, 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 Adam Smith's reason for the main reason he wrote the wealth of nations was to make a point about international trade economics began as a as an analysis of international trade so i think it's important to talk about it a fourth reason it's not all that important but it's my it's my research specialty so i know most about international trade but i do think it's an important topic and can be an interesting one and there there are a huge amount of fallacies that are out and about in the public about, about international trade. So let's do some background first as we shift to international trade. Um, prior to, or at the time Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations in the mid 18th century, what Relatively few writings there were on a topic that we would today recognize as, oh, that looks like economics. They were almost all, nearly 100%, they were almost all on international trade. And while there were differences among the various people who wrote these things, they did it in England, they did it in France, they did it in Italy, they did it in Germany. Um, there is enough similarity among all the stuff that was written before Adam Smith so that we can give it a name. We can identify certain common features in it and give it a name. The name is mercantilism. Mercantilism. I'll put it up in just a moment. Mercantilism. Mercantilism -ism was the dominant way, the almost exclusive way that people thought 
about trade, international trade, trade between peoples in different countries, until Adam Smith first put quill to parchment many years ago. Adam Smith hated mercantilism. You can just tell. He just despised it. And he was burning to explain why it was wrong. That's why Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations. And he did it in a very scholarly way. But that was his motivation, I believe. Not believe, I, I know. So what is mercantilism? So that's the, you can see it. The M-E-R- C and T I L S M. Adam Smith didn't use that word. He called it the mercantile system. It's now called mercantilism. So, what are the features of mercantilism? What are the common threads that run through all of these pre Adam Smith writings? One is that, here's what the mercantilist believe that there is a fixed amount of wealth in the world. There's a fixed amount, or it, whatever amount of wealth in the world there is, has nothing to do with human activity. It's just out there. The only question is who gets it. There's a fixed amount of wealth. Therefore, number two, all trade is what we call today zero sum. I'll give you an example of what that means. All trade is what we call zero sum. If there's a fixed amount of wealth in the world, fixed amount of prosperity, and you and I trade, and I gain, well, I'm wealthier. If that's true, then you or someone else must be made poorer because there's a fixed amount of wealth. Imagine a, a pizza pie. You, you, you can call references like the pizza pie view of the world. Standard, there's just one, the size of the pizza. And if I get a bigger slice of pizza, that means the average slice left for you is going to be small. It has to be. There's a fixed amount of pie. If I get more of it, you got less of it. The mercantilists believe that. There's a fixed amount of wealth in the world. So if one person gets more of it, it must mean that someone else gets less of it. How can it not be? For the mercantilists, it was just a logical, indisputable conclusion because they started with the premise that there's a fixed in the world, there's a fixed amount of wealth. Therefore, all trade is zero sum, meaning it doesn't, it neither increases nor increases, but don't nor decreases, trade does. The total amount of wealth in the world. Number three, the mercantilists believe. That money is wealth. I have here not an equal sign, but an identity sign. Three lines. Money is wealth. It's not like wealth. It is wealth. The mercantilists believed, it's, it's hard to believe they believed this, but they did. Remember early on in the semester, I gave me the uh, uh, hypothetical push at all Jeff Bezos' money or Elon Musk's money, but you're stranded on a desert island. How rich would you be? Not rich. The mercantilists said, oh, that person would be really rich. He's got a lot of money. That was the part that was central to the mercantilist belief. They wouldn't hear anything otherwise. They really believed that. So money is the same thing as wealth. It's, and nothing other than wealth. Access to goods and services, that's not wealth. Money is wealth. Let me remind you real quickly, the full title of Adam Smith's 1776 book is an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. I spent some time sharing with you Adam Smith's view of the causes of the wealth of nations, the division of labor. But the first part, the nature, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. The nature of wealth, Adam Smith said, this is aimed at the mercantilist. The nature of wealth is not money, it's consumption, it's ability to consume. Money is simply a means in a prosperous society that allows us 
to consume. It's part of what allows us to consume. It's not. The money is not the wealth itself. The money is a claim on the wealth. The mercantilists disputed that. They disagreed with that. A fourth belief of the mercantilists, therefore, is that the goal of national trade policy is to enrich the nation, which requires, and this is a mercantilist term, it's an old-fashioned term, beggaring thy neighbor, to turn thy neighbor into a beggar. Just like the mercantilist believes, have a look. The, the, the world's divided into different countries. It's just how it is. It's still, still the way today. Obviously, the responsibility of each country's leader, whether it be a, a, a monarch, whether it be a democratically elected legislature, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the goal of each nation's leader, of course, should be to maximize the welfare of the people of the nation. I think few of us would dispute that. Well, if there's a fixed amount of wealth in the world, <coughs> how do you make your people wealthier? Well, you gotta grab some of it, you gotta entice some of it, you gotta attract some of it from outside of the country. And unfortunately, because there's a fixed amount of wealth in the world, say the mercantiles, if our national trade policy succeeds in making us richer, then we have to be getting richer at someone else's expense. And if we get really rich, then we'll make our neighbors, our other countries, so poor that they will become beggars. So the Mercantile said to each government, your goal should be to beggar thy neighbor. Make other countries as poor as possible, because in doing so, you'll make yourself richer. Or state a little bit differently. Make yourself as rich as possible. You can only do so by grabbing as much wealth from other countries. And if you do that, you're going to make them poorer. The Americans were, weren't advocating war. You could, you could literally seize wealth. You could raid other countries. But by Adam Smith's time, war was becoming a little bit less glamorous. And so people preferred to trade rather than raid. No problem, said the mercantilists. Trade can be a means of enriching a country. Because if you trade and you manage to get a lot of money in, then you become rich. So here's what trade policy should be, say the mercantilists. Each country should try to arrange to import as little as possible and to export as much as possible. I'm going to go off a little sidebar here and just make sure we all understand simple terms. You probably all do, but I just want to be sure. The term import is a name for a good or service made abroad or sold by someone in a, in a foreign country to someone in the home country, in the domestic country. An export is a good or service sold by someone in the home country to someone abroad. So each good that's traded internationally is an import and an export, depending upon the countries that you're talking about. So I drive a car that was assembled in Japan, made in Japan, as is said. From America's standpoint, that car is an import. It was made in Japan, and it was sold in America. From Japan's standpoint, that car is an export. It was made in Japan and sold to, in, to a foreign country. So the import, well, imports are things that we buy from foreigners, to put it simply. Exports are things we sell to foreigners. So say the mercantilists, back to this. Imports are bad. You know why imports are bad? Because when we import, we give up money. That's what you buy imports with money. We get the stuff, the foreigner gets the wealth. That's bad. 
exports are good. Because what do you get when you export? You get money. You give a foreigner something you made, and the foreigner gives you money. You become richer as a result. So mercantiles argue that the purpose of trade policy for each country should be to arrange for its citizens to buy as little as possible from foreigners, to import as little as possible, but to sell as much as possible. To import as little as possible and to sell as much as possible. Now, that would make a country rich. And every country should try to do that. Of course, if every country is trying to do that, not every country can do it. Some are going to say, if one country succeeds, another country has to fail. One country, because one country's imports are another country's exports, one country manages to export more than another country. Some other country has to manage to export less than it imports. So the mercantilists recognize that not every country could succeed at this, but that's just the world we live in. It was, it was a very, very um, uh, uh, sad view of the world the mercantilists had. All right, this is the this is the way people thought about trade when Adam Smith began writing the Wealth of Nations, and he and his friend David Hume starting in the 1850s, just thought this was nonsense. There were people, ample people before Smith and Hume, but Adam Smith and David Hume, particularly Adam Smith, are the ones who really brought it home. They just thought this was nonsense, and they wanted to explain why. And economics, ever since, has largely been, when it talks about trade, has largely been a discourse against mercantilism. Why this was wrong. We economists, however, have not been very successful outside of our own profession. The vast majority of people today are still mercantilists. We call them neo mercantilists. It's still, this way of thinking about the world is still very prevalent. Almost all politicians, no matter which party, are mercantilists, or at least they talk as if they are. I think most of them are sincere, they believe it. The vast majority of business people are mercantilists. They, this is what they believe. Economists argue, and I'll explain why we argue, we think this is thoroughly mistaken. We could be wrong. The vast majority of the world disagrees with us. But I'll at least share with you the arguments that economists offer against it. On no issue, I should say, in no public policy issue. Are economists in more uniform agreement with each other than on trade? Again, it doesn't make it right, but it's, a, it's, it's at least a piece of useful or interesting information. So you survey, and this is done frequently, you survey economists all across the political spectrum, from Marxists to hardcore right-wingers, and everyone in between. Consistently, about 90%, 90% of economists basically take the view that Adam Smith did. Most economists support what's called a policy of free trade. I want to define what free trade means. But let me uh, so share one more thing with you before I define that. I should, uh, I think it's important that students be, that any audience be aware of the biases of the speaker, the teacher. So here's my bias. I drive a car made in Japan, and I have a Virginia license plate with a vanity tag. And you may know, in Virginia, you get a maximum of seven characters in one space. So here is the vanity tag that I have on my car, and I've had it on my car for decades. FRE space CRDE, free trade. It's, it's, it's parked here on campus right now. Maybe some of you have seen it. Um, so that shows my bias. I, like most economists, I support a policy of free trade. I support a policy of free trade not because I popped out of the womb 
being a free trader. I support policy of free trade because economics, I accept the economics of it. To support a policy is a normative position. But because of what the economics, what I think the economics teaches me, that leads me to say, oh, therefore, given my values, I think that a policy of free trade is the best policy to follow. The alternative policy is called protectionism or mercantilism. Today, we more commonly call it protectionism. Let me explain what these two different policies are. They're at opposite ends of the spectrum. A policy of free trade is a policy under which the home country government, in the United States, I'll use the US for obvious reasons, as the home country government. Policy of free trade is a policy under which the home country government pays no attention to the origins of the things its citizens buys, its citizens buy, or the destinations of where citizens sell. The government doesn't care where what you buy comes from. It treats all goods and services the same regardless of where they are produced, regardless of where their sellers are located, regardless of their sellers' identity or nationality. We have, by the way, within the United States, this is constitutionally guaranteed, within the US, we have a policy of free trade by constitutional law. The government of the state of Virginia in Richmond doesn't care, because it's not allowed to care, doesn't care where the stuff comes from that we Virginians buy. We choose to buy wine from Virginia, we can do that. We choose to buy wine from California, we do that too. The government of the state of Virginia can't put a penalty on those of us living in Virginia if we choose to buy some out-of-state product. Nor can the government of California do that to Californians, the government of Nebraska do that to Nebraskans. So in the US, we have free trade. Free, a policy of free trade is followed, again, if the government treats all products the same, regardless of where they come from. So let me be clear what this means. Free trade does not mean that trade is free. And you know, you get things for free, that's not what it means. It means that there are no government imposed constraints on you if you wish to buy something made in a foreign country compared to if you wish to buy that thing made here. If you want to buy foreign made steel, you're free to do so, just as you're free to buy domestically made steel. If you want to buy a foreign car, you're free to do so, just as much as you want to buy domestically made car. The policy of free trade is perfectly consistent with regulations on the products that are made. If the US government has, as it does, safety regulations on the cars that can be legally sold here, it has to have uh, passive restraints like seat belts and has to have collapsible steering columns and new automobiles, then no matter where the cars are made, whether they're made in Detroit, Tennessee, or Japan, they have to have those things, or Germany. It's perfectly consistent with the policy of free trade. What's not consistent with the policy of free trade is that the government penalizes you if you want to buy something from a foreigner instead of you buying it from a fellow American. Protectionism is the opposite. It's when the government penalizes or, in the extreme, prohibits the purchases of goods made abroad. It's called protectionism and we'll see this in more detail in a moment. It's called protectionism because the, the, the belief is that it protects domestic industries and domestic workers industries in the home country, workers in the home country, from foreign competition. And that is believed to be a good thing. It's believed to make the home country richer. And that's the debate that had raged 
for centuries and still rages today. Do does protectionism help or hurt the whole country? The chief one more piece of jargon. The chief tool that governments use when they institute protectionist policies is something called a tariff. T a r i f f. A tariff. The tariff is simply a tax on an import. There are also export tariffs. But we're ignoring those in here. The chief tool that governments use when they want to practice protectionism is a tariff. A tariff is a is a tax on imports. And you can see how it would work. The government wants to protect. U.S. automakers from foreign competition. The, go the, the government then imposes a tariff on imported automobiles into the U.S. and, and not on domestically made cars. Then, then that. So if you have to, if, if, if you're American and if you want to buy a Japanese car, you got to pay that extra tax. That makes it less attractive to you to buy that foreign-made car, meaning it makes it more attractive to you to buy the American-made substitute. The higher the tariff, the less attractive the foreign-made product is, and the relatively more attractive the domestic product is. So governments typically use tariffs as the chosen tool for protecting domestic industries. Sometimes governments outright prohibit imports, but for a variety of reasons, mostly they don't do that. They use tariffs. They raise tariffs if they want to make it more likely that domestic citizens will buy from fellow citizens as opposed to buying from foreign producers. So a huge debate rages over trade policy. This is not a course in international trade. Every fall, uh, tomorrow night, I teach a course, Econ 385s, meant for non-econ majors. It's called International Economic Policy. It's a whole semester-long course on trade policy. This is not a semester-long course on trade policy, so I'm only going to talk about it relatively briefly. I'm going to get the highlights. There are three big worries that people have about a policy of free trade. In other words, if, 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 if an economist comes into the room and says, uh, I propose that our government follow a policy of free trade. I propose that our government pays no attention to where the things that Americans buy come from. Americans should be free to buy from other Americans. They should be free to buy from the Japanese. It doesn't matter. Most people look at that economist and go, hmm, you're crazy. Why do people think economists are crazy when we say that? There are three big reasons. I mean, it, again, in the real world, if you take my 385 class next semester, or two semesters, or, or two years from now, <clears throat> you'll get, I go through the whole much longer list, about 30. There are three major reasons, and they're all tied together, for why people worry about protectionism. I, th I think I have a, I think I put this on a slide. I think I do. Yep. These are the three big worries. Jobs, trade balance, and wages. People worry that if we trade freely with other countries, that that will diminish the number of jobs in the home country, here at home. And that kind of makes sense, right? Seems to. Well, if we buy cars made here, then we're helping to employ Americans in the auto industry. That's good. If we buy cars made in Japan, we're helping employ Japanese in the auto industry. I have nothing against the Japanese, but I'd rather help my fellow Americans. 
So we allow Americans to buy freely cars made in Japan. Too many Americans will buy too many Japanese-made cars. That means there'll be too few cars produced in the US. American auto workers will lose their jobs, and they will. And that will cause employment in the American economy to fall. So we can't have free trade, the argument goes, because free trade will threaten jobs, reduce overall employment in the economy. A second argument that people worry about, and we'll see how it's very closely connected with the first, is that if we have free trade, we'll get unbalanced trade. You ever heard the term trade deficit? Of course you've heard it. How many people would be willing to stand up publicly in here and tell me what the trade deficit is? What is it? Uh, pretty close, yeah, that's good enough. It, it, when we import, what do we export? Most people who talk about trade deficit, by the way, don't even know that. Um, on no issue, on no public policy issue, is the understanding of the public and the punditry and politicians so at odds with the understanding of economists that are the issue of the trade deficit. Trade deficit has a bad sounding name, deficit. By the very nature of the word, it sounds bad. Whenever the U.S. runs a trade deficit, it, it is reported as bad news. Everybody thinks it's bad news. Every politician, every grandmother thinks it's bad news. Most economists, however, think it's good news. I'll explain why. But the worry is if we don't, if, if we have free trade, we're going to have unbalanced trade, and that's bad. We're going to lose jobs. We're going to run trade deficits. Not good. The third concern that we'll talk about is wages. This one applies only to high wage countries like the US. And the concern is the following. Well, if we Americans trade freely with low wage countries, I mean, countries that pay wages a lot lower than us. <clears throat> I'm not talking about Canada or the Netherlands. I'm talking about Vietnam or Pakistan. The wages there are a lot lower. If we trade freely with them, how will any American firm survive? Even Mexico, the average wage in Mexico is about one manufacturing wage. In Mexico, is about one eighth of the manufacturing wage in the United States. <clears throat> how could it possibly be that if we trade freely with Mexico, American industry can compete? Mexican, they, get, they only get paid one eighth what American workers get paid. So if we have free trade, the worry goes, the only way Americans will be able to compete or keep any jobs at all is by having to accept wages as low as the wages being paid in the third world or in really poor countries. Countries much poorer than us. All of these beliefs are prominent, each of these three beliefs. They are held by the majority of people in the media, they are held by the majority of the public, they are held by the majority of people in politics. Every one of them, I believe, is wrong, is mistaken. And I'll explain why I think it's mistaken. So I have, I have a question for you. Uh, I'm going to continue lecturing for a while. We can take a break, like a five, six minute break, and I'll go longer. Or I can keep lecturing and we'll get up 10 minutes earlier. What do you want? Who wants to take a break? Who wants to keep lecturing? Majority rules. I'll keep lecturing. Uh, if you have to keep, if you have to need your calls, I understand. I'll keep that. I won't ask you why if I'm boring. So why, why do these three? accounts which seem so plausible not hold up. I'll, I'll wait until the intermission group leaves. A lot of people are using the restroom with their backpacks. Okay. 
I promise I'm going to say something really important that if you're not here, we we'll regret not being here. Uh, too bad for them. I'm heartless. Yeah. So you mentioned that free trade, there's no restrictions on free trade. Quiet, please. Is it still free trade? Is there a benefit to provide to a certain party? Uh, uh, no, no. So the, the, uh, uh, under a policy of free trade, the government just turns a complete blind eye to the destination of to to, 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 to the origin of where things come from. You, you don't get you don't get rewarded. You don't get penalized. It's just it, it, it's like just like government Virginia. Think about how how goods and services come into Virginia from other states. Richmond pays no attention. And, uh, and, and, and that, and that, that if, a, if a national government were to follow the same policy, it would be just like Richmond. It wouldn't care. It wouldn't be part of its policy makeup. They have, by the way, in a hand, just, just real quickly, um, the vast majority of governments have not practiced the policy of free trade. The United States government has never practiced the policy of free trade. It's, on more free trade, a little bit less free trade over the years, never fully free trade. There have been a handful of governments that did. Hong Kong, from the mid 20th century until just the past, well, actually, still technically it does, but probably now less. Hong Kong, a complete free trade country, was certainly the, the 60 years from 1950 until at least 2010. Great Britain was a complete free trade country from 1849. Or 1816, depending on how you count, until 1931. But most countries, the governments have have intervened to one degree or another in in trade, and most economists criticize that. Let me emphasize: these are not the only three arguments people have against free trade. There are many more, but these are the only three we're going to talk about here because these are the three that by far loom largest. These are the three that voters care about most, that politicians care about most. So these are the ones we're going to talk about. Let's look at the big one, jobs. And let's start by me asking you to play along with me with a few, a few assumptions. I'm, I'm not a cartographer. But my goal here wasn't to accurately portray China than the US. That, it, it, it doesn't matter what they look like. I could have drawn triangles. I, 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 no commentary upon my drawing. That's not the point. But here is the point. Let's start with the following assumptions. Let's assume, for simplicity, I'm going to drop these assumptions some of these anyway. Let's assume that there, there are only two countries in the world China and the U.S. By the way, 30 years ago when I gave this lecture, it was Japan and the U.S. 30 years from now, there's some other country. Probably some sub-Saharan African country that people in America are worried about. But today it's China. So it's China and the U.S. There's no Germany, there's no Great Britain, there's no Brazil, there's no Japan, there's no Finland. It's just these two countries. Everything else is okay. Let's further assume that Everyone in China, all 1.3 or 1.4 billion of these people, while none of them has any ill will toward Americans, none of them wants anything to do with America. They don't want to buy anything from America. They don't want to visit America. They don't want to educate their children here. No matter how low our prices, they don't want to buy anything from us. Just assume that at the start by assuming that. Oh, one thing before I go on. When I talk, I'm going to talk about countries trading with each other. America trades with Japan, uh, or China, Chinese trade with America, China, China trades with America. That's fine, but understand, countries don't trade with each other. There's no thing called China that trades with this thing called America. Whenever we talk about trade between countries, such as trade between China and the U.S., we're always talking about flesh and blood people here, trading with flesh and blood people here. If, if when I say China sold to America, or China bought from America, or America bought from China, understand, as you should, 
What I'm really saying is some people in that geographic part of the globe that we call China, some flesh and blood people, traded with some other flesh and blood people located in that geographic part of the globe that we call the United States. Countries don't trade, people trade. Only people trade. Sometimes they do so individually, sometimes they do so collectively as in corporations or in buying cooperatives, but always individuals. It's flesh and blood people, not countries. All right, with that. So what if, what if no one in China, every last man, woman, and child in China was utterly different to America, wanted nothing from America? If that were the case, how many goods and services do you think the Chinese would produce, put on boats, and ship to America for sale to America? Who said zero? Zero. Zero. Why would they? Why would they? Why would China? Remember, goods. Uh, but China is filled with human beings, and the economy works the same there as it does everywhere else. In a broad sense, they have scarcity. So why would they use their scarce labor and scarce resources to produce valuable goods? For sale to Americans, if they didn't want anything from America. Yeah. Huh? I can't hear speed up. You get mad. It's still scarce. Why, so why would they use it producing things for us? Yeah, but what, what, why would they produce things? If they don't want anything from us, what do they have to gain by selling us stuff? Right, they get, Amer they get American money. But if you don't want anything from America, what, could Amer what does American money do you? Say again? I'm aware. There are only two countries in this world. There are only two countries in this world that I'm talking about. But, 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 but what I say applies generally. I appreciate your answering my question, by the way. So, but, 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 let me get to what you're talking about. We do, in fact, observe the Chinese using their labor and their resources to produce valuable goods that would be useful to them, but instead, they put them on cargo ships and ship them across the Pacific Ocean to strangers in America. That's what we actually observe. They send us stuff. I'm going to put another graph up in a moment. I would normally draw if I were in a proper classroom. But uh, if I hadn't told you, this is not a proper classroom. I would draw a line showing China selling us stuff or sending stuff to us. And as you said, what do we, what do, what do the Chinese get when they send us stuff? They get American dollars. That's actually what they get. When you buy stuff, you're an American, you buy using American dollars. So put yourself in the position of a Chinese, of Chinese person for a moment. When you sell something like your labor, or some used, a used car you have, or a used skateboard, you sell something you get dollars for, why do you accept those dollars? Is it because you love Abraham Lincoln? Ooh, another monochrome portrait of Abraham Lincoln. I want to get more of these. Why do you accept the dollars? Because you can spend them or invest them. That's the second thing you do. You're a student, you don't do a lot of ladder yet. You spend the dollars. Suppose you wanted to sell your labor. You get a job, you sell your labor, and your employer pays you in dollars, but your employer says, these are special dollars. You can't spend these dollars. It's like monopoly money. Would you keep that job? No. No. You, 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 you accept the money because you can spend it. The Chinese are just like you. They willingly accept American dollars, but only because they can spend it. Where do you spend American dollars? In America. You go to China, you try to spend dollars, you can't do it. You have to convert them to Chinese yuan or renminbi. You can convert them, but why would any bank or any person in China 
be willing to accept American dollars and give up an equivalent amount of Chinese currency. It must be because that person wants to buy something in America. Yeah. There's only two countries in this world. There are only two countries here. I'm going to introduce another a third country here. I'm talk, let's stick with this example. Only two countries here. Right? Only two countries. So, so China can't buy, it, you can't use their dollars to buy anything from Finland. Finland doesn't exist in this world. Only America exists, other than China. So in this world, you would agree that the Chinese accept the dollars. It must be because they want to spend those dollars in America, right? It has to be. Yeah. The reason they take cars is so they can be more trade to us. Say it So, like, they exchange the money, right? And the person exchanges. Um, they, convert, they convert the dollars into. So, so the Chinese sell, they send stuff to us. Yes. They don't do it because they're not doing it, it's not charity. So, they, we give them money for it. And they can use that to trade the U.S. They, so they're going to spend it in the U.S. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. They're going to spend it in the U.S. Let me put a picture back. I'm going to introduce, by the way, a third country. If you want to introduce all 298 countries, I'm happy to do that. Here's the simplest possible picture of trade. The simplest possible picture we can draw. I'm going to complicate it up, however, a lot more. So let's say that what, what the I want to make it a little more concrete. So let's say the Chinese sell us steel, and let's say the amount of steel they sell us is a million dollars worth. And let's assume that's the only thing that takes place. This is a, let's assume this is a, 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 one month. This is the only transaction that takes place. Chinese sell American steel. We give the Chinese in exchange $1 million. Like you, the Chinese accept that million dollars. They're willing to sell us steel for that million dollars only because they know they can spend that million dollars. And you spend the million dollars in America. You can't spend it in China. Again, you can convert it to Chinese currency, but then the person in China who gives you the Chinese currency and accepts those dollars, that person must want to spend the dollars in America. If no one in China wanted to spend the dollars in America, no one in China would accept dollars for anything that they produce. So if we observe the Chinese accepting our dollars, it must be because someone in China, at least someone, wants to send the dollars back to the U.S. as either purchases of American exports or, as we'll, see, as we'll see later, as investments in America. Here, it's just purchases of, of American exports. So the Chinese send us steel. They get American dollars. They get monochrome portraits of George Washington. And they send them back to America. And in this example, they buy American software. It's reasonably realistic here. Americans export a lot of software. We import a lot of steel. So notice, the first, there are a lot of a couple things to notice here. The dollars that Americans sent abroad as to be used to purchase American imports come back to America, in this example, as demand for American exports. That's the most obvious thing to notice. A second thing to notice is that, and this is especially true when you reflect on the fact that people don't care about money, ultimately, they care about what money can buy. What really has happened here is that Americans have bought Chinese steel with American software. The Chinese bought American software with Chinese steel. You can imagine two American, uh, Americans and Chinese meeting somewhere at a tea party or a 
coffee house. And one of them said, you know, I, I, I'd, like, I'd like some steel from you. Oh, yeah, well, I, I have something to sell, but I really want some software. Oh, I have to be a software developer. How about if I give you this amount of software and you give me a certain amount of steel? Deal. Barter could happen. But barter is not the way that most exchange takes place today, as we saw. But ultimately, what's going on in this example is Americans are buying steel from China with software. And the Chinese are buying steel, uh, software from America with steel. The third thing to notice about this, and this is not as obvious as the first two things, but this is what an economist notices. The economist says, well, if we observe this happening, what we can conclude fairly confidently is that Americans have a comparative advantage over the Chinese at producing at least whatever kind of software that is. And the Chinese have a comparative advantage over Americans at producing at least whatever kind of steel that is. Because why would Americans buy that steel from the Chinese? It must be because the Chinese steel producers gave the American steel buyers a better deal than American steel producers did. Otherwise, American, the, the buyers would have bought the steel from Americans. But instead, we observed them buying the steel from China. The Chinese producers were a, able to undersell the American producers. Must be because the Chinese producers, at least as a first estimation, Chinese producers have a comparative advantage over Americans at selling at producing steel. And the Americans have a comparative advantage over the Chinese at producing software. As we saw very early on in the semester, if neither party, here I'm yet using two countries early in the semester, these two people, if neither party has a comparative advantage over the other, no trade would take place. Trade takes place, so it must be the case that one party has a comparative advantage over the other. At producing one thing, and the other party has a comparative advantage over the first party at producing the second thing. Fourth thing to notice, and this is what a lot of people do notice, is that when Americans buy steel from China, some Americans lose jobs in American steel mills. That is true. No one disputes that. Employment in American steel mills goes down compared to if American, if the Americans had bought the steel not from China, but all from Americans. So when we Americans buy some steel from China, we get less employment in Pittsburgh, less employment in Ohio steel mills, less employment in California steel mills, less employment in Alabama steel mills. That's true. Employment in steel mills falls. And employment in Chinese steel mills goes up. You need more Chinese people to produce the steel that's being sold in America. That's why people say free trade reduces employment. People look only at this part of what's going on. They see Americans buying steel from China. They recognize correctly that when that happens, American employment in st American steel mills falls. Therefore, the conclusion they reach wrongly is that American overall employment falls. That is incorrect. It's incorrect because people, as, as I said, they only look at this half that you can see now. If you look at the whole picture, overall employment stays the same. The dollars come back, in this case, all of them come back to America as demand for American software. We're producing more software now as a result. It takes more workers to produce software. So we get more workers employed producing software, some of it for export to China. What trade does is not reduce overall employment. What trade does is shift employment. Specifically, it shifts employment from industries in which the country has a comparative disadvantage into industries in which the country has a comparative advantage. In this example, 
We get fewer people working in, in American steel mills, more people working producing and distributing and marketing American software. Just really quickly as a side note, it doesn't have to be all of this software. Because the Chinese give Americans a better deal on steel, that's why the Americans bought the chunk of steel from China, the American buyers of steel save money. And so they can spend that money elsewhere. More restaurants, going to movies, buying whatever else is made in America. But to keep it simple, we'll just focus on the jobs created in the software industry. That PowerPoint presentation that I mentioned here, I'm going to show you. So in this lecture, I have a, I'm going to make a lot of claims about what the data show, things that have been studied, what economic theory predicts, and what the data show. Economic theory predicts that trade has no impact on the overall level of employment. None. Trade neither increases nor decreases employment. The overall amount of employment. Trade only affects where the employment occurs. <laughs> With trade, we have less employment in the US in steel making and more employment in the software industry. With trade in China, there's more employment in the steel industry and less employment in the software industry. But overall employment in both countries should be the same. Just the location of the employment changes. Nor, by the way, the, the argument is not that the workers who lose their jobs in the steel industry are the same ones who get jobs in the software industry. Of course, that's not true. So we'll talk later about the particular flesh and blood workers who lose their jobs, what to do about them. But if we just look at the overall level of employment, trade has no impact on that. There's no reason in theory to believe that trade will have an impact on the overall level of employment. If you look only, however, at the top part of this graph, then you get misled and say, ah, imports reduce employment. Wrong. Imports do not reduce employment. Imports shift where employment occurs. But what if not all, I'm going to have to draw another graph here. What if not all of the money comes back to America? What if some of it stays in China? I'm going to draw this again, but change it just a little bit. But give me a second. Here. Yeah, if I had a proper classroom, I'd do this on the board. But I don't have a proper classroom. And Gene, you won't give me. Oh, my US is terrible. Okay. I could have just amended the other one. So what if, so here I have America buying the same amount of steel as we did before from China, a million dollars worth. But I have the Chinese buying only $600,000 worth of software from America, not all one million dollars worth. Now it seems like there might be a problem. Because it's true, if, a, if the Chinese buy less software from the United States, well, that's going to be less demand for American <coughs> software. Less demand for American software 
That means that there'll be fewer additional people employed in the American software industry. So what happens to employment? We have to ask, when we look at this picture, why would the Chinese sell us a million dollars worth of steel if they only wanted $600,000 worth of stuff from us? Why do they want the other 400000 What are they doing with it? Can they what? <coughs> who cannot who, who not do that? Yeah, but, uh, but the question is, what are they doing with the $400,000? What are they doing with the $400,000? I, I get that they only want six hundred thousand dollars worth of Americans. So please be quiet. Six hundred thousand dollars worth of software comes. What are they doing with the other four hundred thousand? Close. What's another name for saving? Investing. Investing. Very good. So again, you students, you don't fully appreciate this, but you probably do enough. You look at your parents. Some of you probably do this. You get your check from your job every week or two weeks, however, however often you get it. You can spend it all. You get paid $1,000 this month, you run to the mall, you don't run to the mall anymore. You run to your computer, you spend it all. 1000 bucks in and out. It's fine. But if you get older, hopefully, if you get older, you'll do this, you won't spend it all. You'll get paid. And you spend some of it, you gotta eat, you need clothing, you need some entertainment. You probably want to buy some wine. Mm -hmm. good taste. Okay. Contact me, I'll give you hints. <laughs> yeah, little tips. But you won't spend it all. You'll save it. Yeah. Uh, what's the point of saving if uh, it only has thousands of years? So, the question is, what's the point of saving it if it only has value in the U.S.? Well, so, I'm going to talk in excruciating detail. You probably won't like the detail I go into about what can be done with funds that are or saved. But let, but let me give you a preview now. Why, why do you assume that the savings don't occur in the U.S.? Okay. So, imagine, I'm going to use the name of of uh, a former student of mine from China, a Li, Li Nan Peng, uh, wrote his dissertation under me, graduated in 2019. So Li Peng, he now teaches at Southeastern Louisiana University, PNG. I'm going to use his name. So let's say that Mr. Peng in China is the person who sold Americans steel and got the million dollars. And then Mr. Peng buys Six hundred thousand dollars worth of software with that million. What's Mr. Payne doing with the other four hundred thousand? He's investing it. Now, where do you invest four hundred thousand dollars? You don't invest it in China. I mean, you can stuff it under your mattress in China. You could do that, but you want to get a good return on it. Where do you invest dollars? In America. Again, there are only two countries. I'm going to introduce a third country in a little bit. So I'm not going to get into the details now. I'm going to save that for later. But let me just give you one example. So Mr. Payne, so, 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 let's be clear. If he only wanted $600,000 worth of stuff from America, he'd have only sold the $600,000 worth of steel. He wouldn't bother producing the other $400,000 instead of shipping it to us. So he wanted that million dollars. And he wants to invest that $400,000. So one way he can do that is Say, buy stock on the New York Stock Exchange. If you go to, you go to Wall Street, you want to buy $400,000 worth of stock. You need 400000 U.S. dollars. So Mr. Payne might do that. He goes to Wall Street, and let's say I'm on Wall Street, and I happen to have $400,000 worth of stock that I want to sell. The kind that Mr. Payne wants to buy. So here, Mr. Payne, we would do this to brokers, of course, but here, Mr. Payne, here's my stock. Mr. Payne would give me his $400,000. I'm the American. I now have the $400,000. I might buy $400,000 worth of software. I might buy $400,000 worth of restaurant deals in America. $400,000 worth of 
Well, I can California. That's probably what I would do. I'd spend it. The point is, the money comes back in this example, but it doesn't all come back as demand for American exports, but it will come back. In this example, in this example, the United States runs a trade deficit with China. And because China is the only other country in the world, the United States runs a trade deficit with the world. A trade deficit is a very simple concept. A country runs a trade deficit whenever the dollar amount of its imports is greater than the dollar amount of its exports. And it, for some period, usually one month and one year. Either one month or one year. So if in October, America imported more than it exported, America had a trade deficit for October. If America exported more than it imported, America would have a trade surplus. So in this example, America has a trade deficit of $400,000. Its imports exceeded its exports by $400,000. China has a trade surplus of $400,000. Its exports exceed its imports by $400,000. Unbalanced trade. But that unbalanced trade is created by foreigners wanting to invest in America. If or think of it this way. Suppose Mr. Mr. Payne gets this the, the billion dollars. And neither he nor any person in China wants to invest in America at all. Nothing about American investment opportunities is attractive. All the brokers go to China. Want to invest here? No, 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 no. I don't want to invest in America at all. What is he going to do with the four hundred thousand dollars then? Uh, and Buy stuff from America. They say, okay, well, give me, give, give me $4,000 more of software or some other American export. That's just kind of a lead in to what I'm going to discuss in a lot of detail trade balances. I'm going to go into a lot of detail about the trade deficit. Before I do that, however, I want to return to the graph I had before, the simpler and simplest picture of trade, even though it's a simple, it, it's very simplified to the point of being unrealistic, because there are only two countries here, even though it's very simplified and simple, you can still get a lot of understanding out of this graph. Like, for example, you can see that the money comes back, to the extent that it comes back, it creates employment in wherever it comes back, wherever, in whatever industries the money comes back to buy from. But one thing I, I want to point out about this, is, uh, using this graph, is when protectionists say we can use tariffs to increase employment here, they're wrong. So suppose the United States government imposes such a high tariff on steel that it makes it completely unattractive for Americans to buy any steel. Well, I've got to pay that super high punitive tax to buy steel made in China. No, thank you. I'll buy all my steel made in America. That's what the purpose of the tariff is. We want Americans buying steel in America, not steel made in China. So we're going to impose a really high tariff. So, no Americans buy steel from China. How many dollars then go to China? None. If Americans aren't buying, aren't buying steel from China, Americans aren't sending any dollars to China. So then, how many dollars are, are the Chinese then spending on American-made software? None. 
We can save jobs in the U.S. steel industry by putting a tariff on Chinese steel imports. We can. We can increase employment in the U.S. steel industry by doing that. What we can't do is use a tariff to increase employment in the American steel industry without creating unemployment in the American software industry. We can save steel jobs by, by, by basically restricting steel imports into the U.S. But as we restrict steel imports to the U.S., we restrict the number of dollars that go to China. By restricting the number of dollars that go to China, the Chinese thereby have less, they have fewer dollars to spend buying things from America. The Chinese have fewer dollars to spend buying things from America. They buy less of our, in this example, less of our software. Fewer people get employed producing software. So what's not what, 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 what's what, while protectionism can save some jobs in protected industries, it cannot save an, the overall number of jobs. Protectionism will not increase the overall level of employment. It will simply shift where employment occurs, just as trade simply shifts where employment occurs. With free trade. In point, we get less employment in industries in which we have a comparative disadvantage and more employment in industries in which we have a comparative advantage. With protectionism, we protect jobs in industries in which we have a comparative disadvantage and we have fewer jobs, less employment, in industries in which we have a comparative advantage. Protectionism protects inefficient industries. It protects jobs that are not as efficient as the jobs that would exist in the absence of protectionism. Let me introduce a third country before going back to the trade deficit issue. Give me one more second here to do my own work. It's interesting. In a regular sized classroom, People just don't get up and leave. In an auditorium, it must be like I'm a movie. Mm -hmm. And you're halfway through the movie. And you say, eh, this is a boring movie. I think I'll leave. You don't do that in a regular size classroom. You sit, can't wait till this class is over. Finally. But in an auditorium, I'll get up. Anyway, I'm going to introduce the third country. And my cartography will be just as bad. I'm going to use Brazil as a third country. So I'm dropping one of the assumptions that I did first. One of the assumptions I started with was a world of only two countries. Now I'm dropping I'm introducing a third. If you want, I can do a fourth, fifth, 298. You'll see that the logic holds. China, the U.S. It's interesting. The U.S. is good. Uh, our our uh, initials spell us. Us and Brazil, three countries. Assume these are the only three countries now in the world. I'm maybe a little bit more complicated than before. As before, the Chinese ship us steel, a million dollars worth, so we send a million dollars to China. So as before. We get less employment in the American steel mills. In American steel mills. Now it might be the case, however, that unlike before, the Chinese don't want anything from us, but they might still be willing to sell us stuff in exchange for American dollars. They would be willing to do that if, number one, they wanted they the Chinese wanted something from Brazil, and the Brazilians wanted something from America. 
That's what we have going on here. In this example, the Americans buy steel from China, a million dollars worth. The Chinese use all of the million dollars, they ship it to Brazil in exchange for coffee, they're sick of tea. So they buy a million dollars worth of Brazilian coffee. Then we ask, why would the Brazilians accept one million monochrome portraits of dead American statesmen? Not because they like dead American statesmen, they're just like you. They accept American dollars because they know they can not spend or invest those dollars in America. In this example, the Brazilians spend, take a million dollars to send it back to America for a million dollars worth of software. In this example, from America's perspective, the outcome is identical to what it was in that very first simple example I showed you. Americans have a million dollars worth of imports, namely of steel, a million dollars worth of exports, namely of software. In both cases, with this trade, American steel mill employment falls, American employment in the software industry rises. If you're an American software producer, you don't care if you sell software to China or Brazil. You're just selling a million dollars worth of software. Your employment is the same in both, the amount of workers you employ is the same in both cases, whether or not the software you're producing goes to China or whether or not the software you're producing goes to Brazil. By the way, here, just, just to, make, to be clear, I'm talking about the economics of trade. There's a whole other issue about national defense and 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 and, and, and uh, the, uh, military considerations. I'm, I'm assuming those away. They're actually not. They exist. They're not major reasons for protectionism. The major reasons for protectionism: are people worried about jobs, trade imbalances, and wages. So, in this example, in America and in China, pretty much the same thing is happening. In this example, all three countries have balanced trade. In other words, for all three countries, the amount of their imports equals the amount of their exports. So no country is running a trade deficit or a trade surplus. When an economist looks at this, the economist says, hmm, it must be that the Chinese have a comparative advantage over the Americans at producing steel. The Brazilians have a comparative advantage over the Chinese at producing, well, Brazil, let me back up. The Chinese have a comparative advantage over the Americans and the Brazilians at producing steel. Otherwise, the Americans might have bought steel from Brazil, too. The, the Brazilians have a comparative advantage over the Chinese and the Americans at producing coffee. And the Americans have a comparative advantage over both the Chinese and the Brazilians at producing software. Which, is, which explains why each of the countries produce each of those things. As before, some Americans will be disturbed that our steel imports from China cause some American steel workers to lose their jobs. Some Americans will propose that the American government put high tariffs on steel imports in order to prevent those job losses. If that were to occur as before, we can indeed, with tariffs high enough, prevent Chinese steel from coming into America. That would, however, prevent Americans from sending a million dollars to China. The Chinese don't get that million dollars. The Chinese don't have a million dollars to use to buy coffee from Brazil. The Brazilians then don't get the million dollars. So they cannot buy the software from America. You cannot use protectionism to save jobs in some industries without also destroying jobs in other industries in the same country. It simply doesn't work. Again, I want to be clear. You can, with tariffs, save jobs in some particular industry. Here in America, we can steal industry. What you can't do is increase overall employment with protectionism. You can increase employment in the U.S. steel industry only by decreasing it in the software industry. The Brazilians 
could increase employment in the Brazilian software industry by prohibiting Brazilians from buying software from America, but only by decreasing Brazilian employment in the coffee industry. So let's get back now to the um, case in which, where do I have it? In which, I'm going to go back to two countries. Let me work with three, but we'll keep it simple with two. In which now, um, the Chinese, in this case the foreign country, doesn't use all of its export earnings, all of its dollars, to buy American imports. Again, as I said before, this means America is running a trade deficit with China. Most people think this is bad. They think this is bad because they reason quite rightly that if the Chinese did spend all the million dollars buying American exports, that means that more Americans would be employed producing goods for export. That's true. What's wrong with that argument, however, is that, as we saw a moment ago, Mr. Tang in China didn't sell us a million dollars worth of steel because he only wanted $600,000 from us. He wants a million dollars worth of stuff from us. But he only wants $600,000 worth of our exports. So he must want to spend that other $400,000 investing in America. That money is going to come back to America as investment. Now I have to get a little bit technical. I'm going to take this off so you're not looking at it. Starting about 100 years back, actually, it goes back centuries, but it became formalized about 100 years ago. At the UN, the US uh, International. Uh, uh, because of the Census Bureau, various other organizations around the world, there are international trade accounts. So governments keep track of how much is bought and sold and invested in each country. Every country in the world, everyone, has two accounts, two big accounts. There are some accounts, we're not going to talk about those. There's two accounts, two big accounts. Let me give you their names. They're very simple. One account is called the current account. Very sexy name, the current account. The second account is called the capital account. Another name for it is the financial account. I'll use capital account. Two accounts, the current account and the capital account. Every country has one. I, I, let me draw a picture of that just to I'm going to make it clear. Every country has two accounts. U.S. has it. China has it. Vietnam has it. Mexico has it. You can imagine big account books for each country. Very simple. Two accounts. And there are rules. Accounting rules, accounting conventions about what gets recorded on each account. On the current account are recorded imports and exports. There are a handful of small other things. If you took take a class in international trade, you get to these. They are so insignificant, particularly for a country like the United States, we can ignore them. The two big things recorded on the current account for each country are imports and exports. These are usually accounted for each month or a monthly basis. And then at the end of the year, end of the calendar year, add it up. So each month on America's current account, we record how many exports we have in, in terms of dollars and how many imports we have.
exports are counted as a positive. Imports are counted as a negative. So let's say America, as in that previous example that I just showed you, so we, we import, we export $600,000 worth of goods, and we import a million dollars worth of goods. Well, $600,000 is less than a million. If a country's imports are greater than its exports, as I said before, we say it's a trade deficit. A more correct name for that is current account deficit, which you read the fancy papers, like the Wall Street Journal. They talk about the current account deficit. It's basically just a trade deficit. There are a couple of curly cues that make the two terms differ. It's basically the same thing. A current account deficit occurs whenever the value of a country's exports during the current period, the month, is larger than that country's, excuse me, when that country's imports are larger than that country's exports, <laughs> as it was in that graph that I just showed you. America had a million dollars worth of imports of steel from China and only $600,000 worth of exports to China. America is a current account deficit. <laughs> On the capital account are recorded investment flows. The amount of investments that come into a country and the amount of investments that go out of the country. So when Americans invest abroad, that's counted as a negative on America's capital account. If I invest $100 in a German country, uh, a company, that would show up as a minus 100 on America's capital account. If some German person invests $250 in Apple, however, that's counted as an inflow of investment into America, plus 200 on America's capital account. In the example I showed you before, you can think of it and you can remember it in your mind. It's very easy. It was very simple. The only thing that was happening is that Americans bought a million dollars worth of steel from China, and the Chinese bought $600,000 worth of software from America, and we established that the Chinese person was investing that $400,000 in America. <coughs> Let's assume that Chinese person bought stock, as I said before, in America. So in that example, America is getting from a foreign country an inflow of $400,000 worth of investment plus $400,000. And, and nothing's flowing out. Americans aren't investing anywhere. So nothing's flowing out of America. No Americans are investing abroad in that example. So we say, in this example, America has a $400,000 yeah, $400, capital account surplus. The way these accounts are structured, by definition, if you add them together, they always equal zero. In other words, if a country has a trade deficit this year, you know that country has a capital account surplus in exactly the same amount. If a country has a trade surplus this year, current account surplus, that country has a current a capital account deficit by that same amount. There's no such thing as unbalanced trade, in other words. Every time a foreigner does not use a dollar to buy something from America, to buy some export from America, that dollar, that foreign is investing that dollar in America. A dollar is coming back to America, it's just coming back as investment in America. And investment creates jobs just as does the purchase of exports. When you buy stock in Apple, 
Apple has more money to expand its plan, to do worker training, to, to do research and development. Maybe the investment comes from a foreign land to open up a restaurant in America. Downtown Fairfield out of the gates for a few years. They're a great example of globalization. There's an Italian restaurant in downtown Fairfax owned by a woman from Syria who lives in France. Oh, excuse me, a woman from Lebanon who lives in France. Her brother, Danny Adams. This is years ago, no, it's still the case. But for many years, Bellissimo in downtown Fairfax, an Italian restaurant owned by a Lebanese woman living in Paris, managed by her brother in Fairfax. Sometime, I think it was around 2006, 2007, this woman in Paris bought this restaurant with dollars. She accumulated dollars, she bought the restaurant. She refurbished the restaurant. She hired workers in the restaurant with her dollars. That employed Americans just as if she had spent those dollars instead buying exports from America to France. When the dollars come back to America as investment, that creates employment just as when you invest in America, it creates employment. A trade deficit, in other words, is, not, is simply another name for foreigners being especially willing to invest in America. Why should we be upset at that? But we hear people saying, Democrats, Republicans, people on the left, people on the right, people in the middle, saying constantly, oh, a trade deficit means it was losing that trade. Bad news, America's trade deficit rose last month. Tisk, tisk, what are we going to do? We should fix America's trade deficit. Economists hear this and go, what are you talking about? Why should we be upset if foreigners want to invest in America? Why should we be upset if foreigners get dollars and they look around the world and they say, wow, the best thing I can do with these dollars is to invest them in America rather than cash them out buying American exports. <laughs> Suppose you're walking down the street and you run into uh, Jeff Bezos. You bump into Jeff Bezos and you talk to Jeff Bezos for 10 minutes. What's your name? Dan. Dan. I asked you that before, didn't I? I don't know. Okay, okay, I have Dan now. So, Dan, you run the Jeff Bezos. You talk to Jeff Bezos. Would you like to run the Jeff Bezos? Sure. Why? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you, you, you're, you're, once again, you talk to Jeff Bezos for 10 minutes, and Jeff Bezos says, Danny, I'm impressed with you. I, I, I'm not going to give you anything, but I'm willing to invest in your future. I believe in you. So if you want, I'll lend you money to go to college. I'll lend you money to start a business. Right? How would you feel about yourself? Right. Great. You wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't call your mom and say, something must be wrong. I ran into a successful businessman who must invest in me. What am I doing wrong? Why am I losing? You think fantastic? Right. Someone who knows what he's doing wants to invest in it. Now, you may, for a variety of reasons, Choose not to do that. You might say, "No, I want to go into debt," you know, but you still feel good about yourself. Why should Americans feel bad when foreigners want to invest here? The larger our trade deficit, what that means is that foreigners are spending fewer dollars buying our exports in order to have more dollars to invest in America. Why should we feel bad about that? Why should we worry? Why should we think? Something must be wrong. So we have to fix something. If Jeff Bezos wants to invest in you, Danny, you don't think I have to fix something about myself, do you? No. no. <laughs> America runs a trade deficit to sign that at least compared to other countries, America remains a pretty attractive place for global investors to put their money. They're not putting their money here because they love us. They're not putting their money here because they're patriotic Americans, obviously. They're putting their money because they want to make money. They want it to grow, as we say. It's a good thing. We're doing something right. And when that money comes here, it's beneficial to us. 
Remember the net, the fishing net. Someone had to save in order to provide the resources for someone else to build a fishing net in order to increase the productivity of the worker. Remember from my story, it didn't matter who did the savings. I could have done the savings, the other person could have done the savings. Someone had to save. The more foreigners save, in other words, not spend, and send those savings to America as investment, the more fishing nets we get. The more capital goods we get for American workers to work with. As American workers get more capital goods to work with, American workers become more productive. As American workers become more productive, their wage rates go up. Standard of living rises. An American trade deficit is nothing to be worried about, contrary to the near universal condemnation that trade deficits receive in public discourse. You can, let me be clear, you can tell bizarro stories under which an American trade deficit might be a bad thing. They're wholly unrealistic. In practice, just like you can tell a bizarro story that you run into Jeff Bezos and he decides he wants to invest in you, that somehow, you know, he, or Jeff Bezos was drunk, or you tell them bizarre. America runs a trade deficit because, consistently because America remains a relatively attractive place for foreigners to invest, and, and for Americans to invest also. It's a sign that you're doing something right, at least compared to other countries, and those investments serve us well. And again, when you add the trade deficit or current account deficit to the capital account, which you have to do, because that's how these accounts are structured, they always add up to zero. There's no such thing as unbalanced trade. All the dollars come back. Now let me be, look very quickly, just mention to you in some more detail as I promised a moment ago, some details about how the investment occurs. There are four ways foreigners can invest. There are four uses of money that when the money is used that way, it shows up on the capital account. Let me just list all four and then I'll explain each one. And I'll try to make this take no, no more than five or six minutes. Not a promise, but an attempt. So really quickly, here's the, here's the list of four ways to invest. Equity investments. Equity investments. Equity is a fancy name for ownership. So ownership investments. Debt investments. It's a fancy way of saying you're going to lend money to someone. Real estate investments and cash holdings. Equity, debt, real estate, and cash holdings. Those are the four ways to invest. Whenever a foreigner buys some ownership in an American company, that's considered to be an equity investment in America. So if a foreigner buys shares of Apple, Shares of John Deere, that's an equity investment in America. Whenever, when that Lebanese woman living in Paris bought the restaurant in downtown Fairfax, that was an equity investment in America. A foreigner used the dollars to acquire ownership of some asset in America. When foreigners lend money to America, that's the second way to invest. Mr. Peng in China might lend the money to me to buy a car or to start a business or to go to school. Might lend the money to the U.S. government. The U.S. government borrows a lot of money. Whenever foreigners lend the money, the money comes back. It's just coming back as a loan to Americans and not as purchases of American exports. 
Whenever foreigners buy real estate, for those of you who aren't American, the term real estate means land and all permanent structures on the land. So a house and, and property, that's real estate. A condominium is real estate. It's a permanent structure on land. So any real estate purposes, whether it be commercial, whether it be residential, it doesn't matter. Any purchase of real estate is considered to be an investment. If I were to sell my condo to some non-American, some person living abroad, that would be considered to be an, an investment in America. If I sell my condo for half a million dollars to this Chinese person, that half a million, that half a million dollars would come back to America. I would now have it. I could spend it or invest as I choose. But if you show up on these international accounts as a five hundred thousand dollar investment in America, a five hundred thousand dollar increase in America's capital account, and finally cash holdings. If foreigners choose to hold the cash, that's considered to be an investment in America. They choose to hold dollars. That's actually easy to see, right? If you choose to hold dollars, particularly if you're a foreigner, you're betting that those dollars are going to increase in value. Otherwise, you don't want to hold them. But if you believe that the dollar's value is going to go up, let's say you're a European, you're living in France or Germany, and you have $100, and you think the value of the dollar is going to rise relative to the euro, what that means is you think that in the future you'll be able to get even more euro for your dollars than you'd get it to exchange those dollars now. So you hold the dollars, hoping that you're right. That's an investment. You're hoping its value is going to increase. What I'm going to show next time when I lecture is that all of these four forms of investment, equity, debt, real estate, and even holding cash, under all of them, the dollars return to America, they create employment, no less than if the dollars had been used to purchase American exports. As always, they exactly offset the amount of the American trade deficit, so that when you add the current account to the capital account, they always equal zero. By definition, they always equal zero. I will send you, within the next week, a, a Zoom link for you to look at, and I'll send you that video back. No test that's two weeks from now. Oh. 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 Yeah. Honestly, the discussion board, sorry, I don't read anything. Me neither. And then I just pick a question. Question yeah. and just read the stuff. So now I have to go through all the. Have a link.